The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We have an exciting episode in store for you here today. We're going to talk all about service dogs, and we have a guest that um, I'm very honored was able to come on because she is a very well-known service dog handler and a great trainer here in the States. But first, we're going to start with a quirky tip of the day. From our mascot, Service Pig. (laughs) I did. Gigi's little Julius fit on the pig, so I thought that was too cute. It just says Julius on the label. It doesn't say service dog, but I thought it was a good tie-in. So um, our quirky tip today is I want you to click on this link. Our guest is Frankie Joris and it is her website and her dog training website and they offer a bunch of online classes and a bunch of things that you can maybe get involved in and learn a little bit more about dog training. So please stay up to date with everything going on there. Frankie is coming to us from New Jersey. She has been involved with animals pretty much her whole life. You may have seen her dogs in commercials or movies. She still does a lot of acting, a lot of animal acting with her dogs and uh, she's an agility trainer and she is a service dog handler. So Frankie, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, and look at this. Who's this that's with you already? This is Logic. <laughs> she is a uh, an up-and-coming young service dog. She's a fourth generation of our own breeding of uh, service dog and agility dog. That's awesome. Very cool. So you have been dealing with the oh, service oh, dog oh, thing oh. for a few years, it seems like. I mean, going on like close to a decade now? Yeah. Um, so my partner, Chris, has had a service dog for... More than 20 years. I mean, okay. Same one, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I became disabled. Uh, no, well, I've, I've had disability for a long time, but I had but my first do- service dog is now six years old. And um, so, yeah, I've been and I've been involved in the service dog community for a long time because I've I uh, had as a student and then as a very good friend, Martha Hoffman, who pioneered the huh. San Francisco hearing dog training program in the late 70s. Mm. Awesome. So you're pretty well tied into yeah. all of this. And so Francis Metcalf worked closely with her also oh, yeah? out there. Yeah. yeah, we know Francis out there. So I am interested in mostly um, how you guys are looking at raising these dogs because, you know, you're raising the same dogs that are winning the Nationals and winning Westminster and Agility and they're high drive dogs, these genetics. It's not like this is just some specific program for having these Border Collies be service dogs. And then also just the importance of respecting what is going on with service dogs and the industry and everything else. So tell us a little bit about how you guys raise the puppies and maybe how it may differ. And if it does differ from maybe other like dogs that you're raising that won't be service dogs, you know? So well, we don't really raise our puppies any differently if they're going to be service dogs or agility dogs. And um, in fact, our dogs who are service dogs are also competition dogs. Um, One of Chris's earliest service dogs was also a world team member and a nationals winner. Um, We raise our dogs to have a good work ethic and to understand how to self calm and to um, to become thoughtful puppies from the beginning. Mm. And the nice thing is, if if you had a layover in the airport, your dog could jump over the chairs (laughs) just for something to do. There you go. (laughs) I think think a lot of people picture um, work ethic or or border collies having um, high drive as being active all the time and busy Mm. and this, that, and the other. But in fact, uh, if you think of the ideal of of a dog or anybody really enjoying their job, if their job is to be being quiet, or being thoughtful, then at that point in time, that's what they're being. Mm-hmm. I've had people, when Sia was at a restaurant or, in, or in, in an airplane for six hours sleeping at my feet, looking at her and saying, oh, I've seen a Border Collie in agility, and she certainly couldn't do that because she's so lazy. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, you haven't seen her at an agility trial. She, just, she, she does whatever's required at that time. Mm-hmm. She's been trained. Yeah. yeah. And, and because she understands that, you know, she enjoys doing what, what she's doing um, whenever she's doing it. So mm-hmm. 
if what she's doing is like right now she's lying at my feet and you can't see her but she's like okay that's what we're doing yeah um well and it's stable like it's stability when the dogs have this off switch and they can self-soothe and they can calm themselves and they don't just have to be put in a crate or worked in a lesson for three hours to you know be able to live with them they're more stable. They're more healthy overall. You know what I mean? That's kind of what yeah. they're thriving, just like us. You know, you there. There's great human athletes out there, but they're not now coming home and going 24/7 all the time. Like if you don't have your downtime, and if you don't teach the dogs sometimes to have the downtime, you could see fallout, and we see that a lot. Yeah, I just want to add. I think it's counterintuitive to the average dog owner. Uh, when they see a dog with high energy, they feel compelled to do things to get that energy out of them. So they just keep working the dog and bringing him to daycare and doing agility and just run, 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 because they think that's the answer. And what they're yeah. doing is making an athletic, crazy dog. <laughs> yeah, I think they don't, they don't think about, well, well, how about like a nice massage and a nice calm? Mm. Let's, let's learn how to relax together. Let's learn how to just chill out and, sure. and enjoy that peaceful. I. It sounds kind of like this woo-woo zen thing, but my dogs do what I would call sort of dog meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're all about that woo-woo zen, Frankie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're all about that. No, and it's true. You know, and a, a calm um, dog people, is welcome. People, people um, frequently comment on what lovely pictures our assistant takes of our very, very young puppies. And by very young, I mean like at 10 days, two, two weeks old. And like, oh, she's such a talented photographer. But we've already been massaging them and, and teaching them to relax and hold positions from when they were born. So it's really easy for her because we just like say, oh, let's just like massage you and have you relax and put this cute little hat on you and put you in this cute little position. And, and so they already know how to relax and just and, and be calm. And, and I, th I thought you were just medicating them at that age. <laughs> <laughs> That's happening. We don't even want to joke about that. So I, I am interested in the way that you're talking about massage because sometimes um, I feel like the owners that unintentionally just want to like touch and provide love sometimes can work the dogs up. So when you're teaching the puppies these massage techniques, are you looking at like acupressure stuff? Like what's kind of your go-to there? You're looking at them to get into a certain state. Like what are your goals when you guys are working that way? Or techniques? Um, I'm, I'm looking at... at with a baby puppy, just very, very slow, calm movement. It's funny because I'm just doing this with the, the young dog right now because she's not used to all the construction that's going on because I'm not at home. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But I, 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 from birth, I've started, I start with them at their heads and their, and their ears. Well, what they have is ears then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very slow. She just collapsed at my feet. Yeah. She's mm -hmm. now lying down at my feet. Um, <laughs> Just really just working very slow, soft, deep with the fingers, movements. Um, what the, the key word here is slow, mm -hmm. slow, calm. Soft, calm movements and speaking softly. Um, I'm starting to go to sleep, Frankie. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's so intentional with your, you're intentional with yeah. your, what you're yes. trying to get across to the dog. You're thinking, yes, you're here and you're being interviewed and you're able to multitask. But when you're doing these, when the dogs are young, you guys aren't thinking about, okay, what are we going to make for dinner tonight? You're thinking about no. that puppy and, and that moment. The focus is entirely on the puppy and entirely on what we're doing right then. And, and it is, and, and like, so I, I, I was joking right then, I'm talking to you very calmly, but a lot of what goes wrong with when I see students do it is that they'll be talking to me very calmly, very ch chipperly and going, look, I'm, I'm petting her. I don't know why she's not calming down. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm trying. I mean, look at me. I'm really trying. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, and you're talking to me a million miles an hour. Yeah. Um, and, and there's that scientific principle of entrainment where if your heartbeat slows down and your pace slows down, the everyone's heartbeat and it's and 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 movements will slow down in rhythm together. So it becomes therapeutic for the dog handler as well as the dog. It does. Yeah. But often what happens with entrainment is that. Where are you going, Frankie? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's okay. Go ahead. I, I had I had a dog foot caught in my mouth. <laughs> often what happens with with entrainment is that it's the opposite. The dog gets all hyped up, and the person will start to have their heart rate and their energy level rise to meet the dog's energy level rather than trying to lower the dog's level to theirs. Mm -hmm. And when we start with puppies, we work with lowering their level to ours and we work with 
young dogs, you know, who haven't had our protocol, it's much harder. Mm -hmm. um, but we do the same thing. Well, and how brilliant is it then if they are going to be canine athletes that when they're having other people now, you know, do body work on them and stuff, they're already just so used to that. And they're probably falling into that and enjoying that on a much deeper level, much earlier in their lives. Absolutely. And, and a dog who's going to be a service dog who can sleep at your feet during a board meeting or whatever is great. But a dog who's going to go to international events and who could be calm with all the travel and all the, you know, hotels and all that is going to do better in competition. Yeah, they put the all the energy into it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. So we really, we want, you know, if you think about it on a deeper level, you want the exact same things from, you know, from a dog like fame, who's going to win Westminster or a dog like mayhem, who's going to go be on the world team. Then you want from a dog like Sia, who's going to be taking care of me in the hospital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, know, you really do want the same things from any working dog. We just don't necessarily think about it the same way. Yeah. And Sia was your first um, service dog, correct? Yes. But Chris does the agility aspect of her life. Is that true? Yeah. Well, right now, um, right now, because Chris can't run, I'm doing the agility <laughs> okay. aspect of her life, too. But yes, Chris is competing with her in agility and training her in agility. And um, I uh, had her as a service dog. But it doesn't matter to you. I mean, that doesn't affect anything with your training. If you're going to be doing agility training with her, it, it's all the same for you. No. Um, no, it doesn't. It's, one um, one thing I wanted to just uh, interject here is that, you know, you're a dog trainer, Frankie. So, you know, you're able to take a Border Collie, which is a high drive dog that they have their own quirks. You know, they can be have noise sensitivity, this, that and the other thing. And you've molded them into a, a decent service dog, whereas typically service dogs are golden retrievers or, you know, different, yeah. more calmer animals than or less reactive, I would say, than a Border Collie. So. Uh, the only reason I bring this up is because I get a lot of clients that call me and say, I want to get a, a TDI on my dog, a service dog thing. And they have some, you know, wild well, that's um, therapy dog, but yeah, that's what, that's yeah. what I mean. And, yeah. uh, but they have a rescue of some kind and it's not that they couldn't do it, but just the amount of work to do it with any dog is a huge commitment. And people don't realize the commitment, let alone calming behaviors. As soon as they get a taste of how much work it is, all of a sudden it's not that important, you know? Yeah, it is. It is a massive amount of work, and mm -hmm. I think, particularly, like I said, you know, take a dog like Sia or or Logic. You know, they're third and fourth generation of breeding um, dogs who you know have been really bred to have this particular temperament. They are mm -hmm. border collies, but they are not really typical. Yeah, you don't um, you don't breed the stuff that you don't like, or yeah, I understand yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I, I cringe sometimes when I, I'm on a lot of service dog groups on Facebook and stuff, and people are like, oh, I have this rescue I rescued from a terrible situation where it was abused and bit six people, and I'm going to turn it into a service dog, and I'm like, oh, why? Yeah, yeah. and it's not, it's not possible, and that happens, you know, it's unattainable. People want a diabetic alert dog, and, you know, they just think, oh, I can just go get a puppy and make that happen. Like, no, this is hours and years and decades of training that goes into this like that's yeah. why an mm -hmm. actual service dog costs as much as it does sure <laughs> like yeah <laughs> and i and i see this time and again and people are like you know it's their first dog or their second dog and they go and get they want to do a rescue and they want and, and i you know it's like yes i think it's a wonderful idea to have a rescue dog and this that and the other but you already don't have experience training right yeah and you're picking like the worst possible prospect to do this with mm-hmm and, uh, you know, I made the mistake of confusing the service dog with a therapy dog earlier when I was talking about, but I had a woman that called me that she had a Newfoundland that she rescued with dog aggression. She took that whole, she took the dog to get the therapy, the, the dog did get the therapy dog international thing. Uh, and the thinking was, and they've changed it since, but it was all done one dog at a time. Now they have, however many dogs show up, they all got to do it together. And yeah. now the dogs with dog aggression are getting washed out. Because genetics do matter. If you're going to breed a litter of lab puppies that are supposed to be seeing eye dogs, not all of those dogs make it into homes with blind people. Because, That's for sure. Because, you know, it, it's a very careful selection process with all of this. We are going to go to break super quick. And when we get back, I want to talk about more how we need to respect the service dog industry. And then also that raising these puppies from now until actual working animals. So we'll see you after okay. break. Does your dog seem anxious? Would you like your dog to relax? Do you want to feel more in control? Would you like your dog to cooperate? HowToCalmYourCanine.com That's HowToCalmYourCanine.com
com. All right, she's talking quiet and she's still rubbing. So how far away, Logic, you said the younger dog's name is? Yeah. How far away would you say Logic is to be to the point where Sia got while she's out, like actually working, you know, in public? Um, I would say probably with her another three or four months. Um, Sia work started was working already when she was Logic's age, but Logic is a little behind because of COVID and not being out a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so all the puppies are behind yeah. because of COVID. Yeah, all the yeah. A lot of things are behind. Mm-hmm. We have, we've had a lot going on lately. And then as yeah. far as like time frame, so Sia, what, what was Sia? Like a year, a year and a half? It was a year and a half. When okay. She started really, um, when she transitioned from being in training to really being a working service dog. So that, yeah. So the better part of 16 months or so of yeah. teaching that dog to be calm, and uh, just with, making that foundation of calm with behavior. With professional dog yes. trainers also. With we're, not, we're not just talking yeah. about like the random Joe Schmo. And then would you say that's a similar time frame for Chris? I mean, I know she's been at the game longer, but would you say it's about a year to a year and a half that she would put in as well? Or it just depends on the dog? Um, yeah, I, act, I, I think um, about, about the same. I've actually been doing it longer she's had them longer but i've actually been training them longer okay (laughs) so that's pretty much your time frame but yeah because even if you train they're they're still so young still maturing sure yeah they're just even 18 months is young yeah and i think of like i mean sia at 18 months compared to what she's like now even though she was working i mean now she's just so level-headed and serious there's like nothing Mm -hmm. settled in sure yeah, that is super nice. Oh, so nice. I uh, this gets this topic gets abused a lot, and I want to touch on that um, with you because as a random person, you can say everything you want, whether you host a podcast or not. You know, it doesn't really matter. But I mean, you guys are directly affected by this, so I just kind of want to talk about how important it is to really respect this industry and um, what people like the places they can look to do it, and just kind of your take on that because I know you feel passionately about that. Uh, do you mean about like cheating, not cheating, that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah. What, what a service dog actually means. It's not a, something so to bring I a think, dog into a restaurant because the car is hot. I think, so I think the really important thing for people to remember is that a service dog in itself has no rights whatsoever. If I were to hand you Sia, you couldn't take her into a restaurant. Mm-hmm. A disabled person has the right. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, you know, if I'm disabled, that dog is my my tool, the same as a wheelchair or anything else. Right. Um, and and I think people need to to realize that that you know what she is is the same as a wheelchair, the same mm-hmm. as a cane, the same as something else. That um, when you're saying that your dog is a service dog. What, you know, what you're saying basically is that you have a disability, mm-hmm. that you need to have this dog with you to help you out in and various things. But uh, the flip side of it is, is that the bigger issue for me has been people who seem to take great pleasure in thinking they can tell when somebody's quote unquote cheating. Mm-hmm. And that has become almost a bigger issue. We have so much, so many problems with, with gatekeepers as it is, with people telling you, you can't bring your dog here, you can't bring your dog there, right. thinking they know the laws. Mm-hmm. Um, that, yes, there are people who, who feel like, oh, I'm going to lie and bring my dog here and do bring my dog there, and that's crappy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's crappy when you lie about anything or you cheat about anything, and, and, and it's dishonest and all that. Um. But at the same time, when we have people who are constantly thinking that they have a right to know, they have some magical power to know what disability I have and whether I'm really disabled and whether my dog is really a service dog and they have some magical ability to tell, Mm -hmm. they're making it harder every time some disabled person who has a not very obvious disability tries to go somewhere. Sure. 100%. No, it's very true. And and it's it's putting the disabled person in a point where you shouldn't now have to defend yourself or you, you don't have to answer to anyone in public, you know, and that's something that seems to happen quite frequently in public. You know, somebody will walk by and 
people will ask like, oh, what, why, why do you have that dog? And they, they just feel as yeah. though just because there's a dog there, like it's like being at, you know, the petting zoo and, oh, we can talk about this. It's an animal. Yeah. Like it's private. <laughs> I, we had that, I mean, just the other day when Chris was in the hospital and the nurses and they were, they're just in places where you think, I mean, the, the, the Americans with Disabilities Act is over 30 years old. It's mm -hmm. not a new thing. People should know better. And the nurses were like, oh, so what does he do? How does he do it? What's wrong with you? Just, and mm -hmm. it was, it's like, you, this is none of your business. Yeah. Focus on taking care of me while I'm here, having surgery yeah. here. Yeah. And it really was just because they wanted to talk about the dog and pet him. Yeah. It's like, no, you know, like it wasn't anything to do with her health care. It's a magnet. The dogs are a magnet for crazy. Yeah. And, 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 and. And you know, uh, I'll put, you know, I'll have this happen when I'm going to a dog event. And here, this is something that drives me crazy, is that people frequently are like, "Oh, isn't it awful?" Like whenever you're going to a dog event, all these people who cheat and say that their dog is a service dog to get it on the plane. I'm sure there are people who cheat. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, let's think about this logically. If you are disabled in any way, you have an allergy, you're diabetic, you have seizures, whatever and you're a dog trainer at a high level, mm -hmm. wouldn't it make sense that you would also train your dog to be a service dog? Yeah, it's completely, of yeah. Of course. And isn't it and nobody's damn business whether you have seizures, allergies, whatever, whatever? <laughs> well, and the I, thing is, is you guys are raising these dogs with the proper genetics from puppies. Yeah. You're not going out and saying, oh, yeah, we'll take the rescue with six bites who's half blind and we'll try to make it into something. Like, this is all a carefully thought out process. And you're bringing these dogs on a journey that you need them for. Like, the whole point of this is for your own safety and your own health, you know? And I, you know, and I actually, for all the times that people are like, oh, I know so many people who cheat to let, get their dog onto the plane. I actually know a number of people who compete at very high levels who in other circumstances fly with their service dogs on the plane and who, when they're going to world team tryouts or things like that, don't say that they're, their actual service dog, they will not admit as a service dog because they're scared that it'll count against them in mm -hmm. competition. Yeah. Hmm. And yeah, that's really interesting. That. Yeah, no, that's true. The stigma is not fair at all. Yeah, and and you know, many people don't want to talk about what's wrong with them, particularly if it's something like anxiety or PTSD, sure, or allergies or things, you know, seizures or things that they think might count against them in competition or whatever. Um, Especially social anxiety. You're already yeah. it's a big commitment just getting out in public, and now you get people berating you. You know. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the other, that idea that a, a service dog, that a, if it's a real service dog, it will always be perfect, is like saying that if you have a real wheelchair, it'll never have a squeaky wheel. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, I'm sorry. Every once in a while, it might burp or fart. It, yeah. It, you know, these things it's a happen. dog. Yeah. It's an animal. It's a living thing. No, exactly. Yeah. Sure. And I think the aspect of just raising any dog in your household to be able to tolerate being in public, to be calm even at a sporting event, an agility event, whatever it's going to be, is not only important for the household, but it's important for the dogs. Like the dogs enjoy that decompression. They enjoy the downtime. Like you equated it yeah. to almost mindfulness in humans. Like it's important and we're all running at such a high rate, it seems that like if we don't teach the dogs that slowing down is important and slowing down is okay, even if it feels a little weird at first, it's essential to their health as well, it seems, you know? It, it is so important. It's funny, um, when I, uh, a little over a year ago, right before COVID, I was, I was in the hospital and I was really, really sick um, for a week. And we had 11 dogs in the house. Um, three of them were not Border Collies. So the- uh, <laughs> A lot was going on. <laughs> the eight Border Collies, from what everyone said, were the really easy dogs, because, you know, <clears throat> that, you know they, they were the ones who spent all day just sleeping and chilling because they were all of our own breeding and they all were raised by us and they had learned how to be quiet if that's what was required and how to chill and meditate and just be like, downtime is downtime. Yeah, no, it's so important. And I, I have to say as a side note, Scott has to run off, but um, yeah. uh, as a side note, when I first saw you and Chris, uh, we were in, Conne ah, I think it was Connecticut. It tails you in. And I ordered these. I don't even think they make these anymore. Um, well, I they don't know if the they were. Oh, my God. And, and even this was an exercise that you guys talked about 
tempering dogs, tempering, you know, yeah. people and everything else. And you taught this like ring toss with it to the dogs. And I have used this exercise for myself and my clients and everything else. And this is the thing is that um, if you are having the dogs think outside the box a little bit, like you're sitting there, you're tempering them to things that may be scary. You're teaching them to settle. They seem to be a bigger, a better package at the end of it. You know what I mean? Like these, Absolutely. these things, while it's like, oh, chucking this at a dog could be stressful. And yes, you're going to train it and be happy. But I love this. And it helped so many fearful dogs, like holding this out and shaping the dog to put their nose through it and feed them and then getting them to actually like reach. Like it literally is ring toss for the dogs because you start to it see is. their necks go. I just, I, it was one of the greatest tools ever. And I have them in, in all these different colors, um, but I, I don't think they make them anymore. So if somebody's they, watching. I, I, I love those. And I, that originally, that trick, I originally designed it when a, a student of mine at Camp Gone to the Dogs had, um, a, an Italian greyhound that was scared of people and got um, got lost and ran away and nobody could catch it. And I thought, I need some trick to teach this dog so it's not scared of things coming yes, at it. Yes, exactly. And it was brilliant. And I'm sure that was years ago. And I hope it, oh, it affected 20. so many so many other people as deeply as it affected me. But literally, I have those rings in every single freaking color. And I've loaned them to students. And half the time, I don't remember who I've loaned them to. But it is a great, great exercise and a great activity. And um, tell me a little bit about what you're doing with movie stuff right now. Is anything going on currently with your dogs? Um, Kiss is in a pilot, a new pilot that's, I'm not sure exactly when it's coming out with Patrick Dempsey called Ways and Means. Cool. Um, and uh, she is going to be his, I think she becomes his dog when somebody dies. Oh, nice. When owner dies. Good. And um, she's also in a really stupid commercial for <laughs> uh, windshield, a, a, a windshield repair company. <laughs> and... Um, Gimli is shoot is scheduled to shoot a movie for Disney. I don't know what it's called that starts shooting in May. That's your little terrier, right? My little Australian terrier. Yeah, yep. you guys have quite the eclectic breeds going on. It's <laughs> it's very impressive. And you said that you might be able to get back to Camp Gone to the Dogs. You said because you're an instructor there. You've been an instructor yes, there for been a few years. Instructor there for over twenty years. Okay, so uh, you uh, which which event which location did you think that you were going to be uh, able to make it to? In the Vermont locations, and right now they're looking for a new place in Vermont because they lost the old facility oh yeah and um so if they as soon as they find a new place in vermont i will be back yeah that's the, the best state back. to have yeah. to head to visit to especially from jersey vermont I, <laughs> it's, I it's always vermont. good to go to vermont we just moved to maine we love maine if you guys are ever up um in the area please let us know um thank you for everything that both you and chris are doing not only for sport dogs and for the world of border collies but also for the service dog industry because it is very important that what you're putting out in public is a calm dog that is not going to be attacking people that is not faking anything and that really can be anywhere. I mean, I see your dogs at concerts, you know, you guys go everywhere with oh, the dogs. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think one of the funniest things about getting my um, COVID vaccine is that Sia was sure that we were going to a concert because <laughs> we were in line for so long. We got to the end of it and you could see her. She's like, where's the what? Music? Whoa, whoa, where's the music? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank right. you for your time. Have a great day. And be sure to check out that link, guys, to see uh, what is coming up as far as Frankie and Chris's training. Nice to training. meet you, Frankie. Thanks for yeah, coming nice on. Nice to meet you guys. Bye, thank Logic. You. Keep it quirky. Bye-bye. <laughs> the views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.